Hi there, guys. It's Mrs. Chappie. Welcome to U.S. History. This is week 11. After this class, we only have one class left. I can't believe it. Time is flying by and going really slow all at the same time. It's so weird. I hope everyone's doing well, that you're healthy and happy and enjoying to the best that you can these videos. I wish that we were in person, but I'm glad that we have this technology. I look forward to seeing you guys on Thursdays during our Zoom classes. That's one of my favorite times. What we're going to be doing this week in our Zoom class is going over the information we're covering on this video. We'll be working out of a worksheet that's in our history notebook, so we will be using the notebooks. Um, if you're not able to attend the Zoom class and you want to do that through this video, you're totally welcome to do it. Let me show you what the worksheet is. This is the particular sheet that we're going to be working on. Rebuild, to rebuild a nation, and it is down at the bottom, page 25. So we will be working on this um, in our Zoom class. So what the topic for today's lesson is on is uh, something called Reconstruction. What Reconstruction is, is that period after the Civil War where they had to reconstruct, recreate the Union because the South had seceded, they had left the Union, there had been this terrible, terrible war. Um, ultimately, the Union was preserved, meaning that the Southern states could not leave. And so now we're into this, this phase of history called Reconstruction, where the country is coming back together. They're trying to navigate through how um, freed, enslaved people, Blacks are going to have rights and what that's going to look like and what's going to need to be done to make that happen. This is a super important part of history because it lays the foundation for things that are going to come in the future in the civil rights movement, things such as that. It's going to show that this wound of slavery is hard to heal and um, those are kind of some of the things that come out of Reconstruction. In my personal opinion, as a history teacher, it's not my favorite um, area to teach because it's kind of dry. It's like they tried this, it didn't work. They tried this, it didn't work. And then this happened, and then we move on to the next thing. So I'm going to try to spice it up as much as I can, but it's just a lot of information. So hang with me. My kids, I've talked to you guys a lot about my kids. My daughter, Ellie, she's in college, and she is majoring in history, and my son, is in law school and he was a political science major, which means he studies the things that happen in history and, and how they affected the outcomes of the governments, basically. So I say to my kids, hey, I gotta go teach reconstruction. Anybody wanna do reconstruction? And the horror on their eyes was like this. It was pretty funny. Um, my son goes, Friedman's Bureau, you get a mule and some land. I'm like, okay, there's more to it than that. So. Here we go, buckle up, we'll do the best that we can. I'm gonna screen share with you all. On the upside, I'm gonna link below a um, Mr. Betts video who summarizes it to music. So that makes it always a little bit more fun when Mr. Betts hops in. We love Mr. Betts, he's kind of cool. So I'm gonna put myself down here over in the corner um, and I will just kind of chat through it. So this is what we call reconstruction. If nothing else, you learn what that word means, that that was the period after the Civil War. So that when you move on to your next history class, if you, um, next time you take US history, you'll go like, oh yeah, I've heard of reconstruction. They're reconstructing. They're, they're coming up with a plan after the Civil War. So that's what we're going to be looking at. And it's bringing the South back in. Remember we talked in the last lecture, I told you guys how at the end of the war, Grant says, these are our fellow countrymen. We're not gonna celebrate, we're not gonna have a party. Um, the Civil War is over, but don't hoop and holler about it because these are our countrymen now. They had left and now we need to bring them back. So that's the idea of reconstruction. If you're my note taker, you can pause the video and make sure you write that down. So to bring the South back in and to deal with the freed enslaved people, there was an, an, a need to change the Constitution. So the Constitution, the way it was written, um, didn't provide clearly for rights of enslaved people. In fact, we talked about that famous case before the Civil War 
um, the Dred Scott case where the Supreme Court found that slaves were property. They were what was called chattel. They were treated like a chair. And so they needed to change the Constitution so that the Supreme Court could never do something like that again. So the first thing they did was do an amendment. That's how we update the Constitution is by amending it. That means we're changing it. And they changed it um, by just basically saying slavery is abolished. So the 13th Amendment prohibits slavery. It abolishes slavery. The next thing they had to do was add another amendment after the 13th Amendment. The 14th Amendment comes in line, right? And this amendment declares that former slaves will have all the rights of citizens, that they have what's called Equal protection. Equal protection is a really important concept in the Constitution because while the 14th Amendment was added to give slaves um, citizenship rights, we use that idea of equal protection all the time. Um, it's used in women's rights. It's used anytime someone says, I'm not being treated equally by the government. They say this is violating that 14th Amendment, that equal protection of the laws. You have to treat everyone equally under the law. Now, it was designed to treat former slaves equally, but it still protects me as, as a woman. It protects um, maybe a private school. It protects um, employees, um, people with disabilities. It protects all kinds of people. So no, sh no state shall deny any person equal protection of the laws. That's the 14th Amendment. Now, there's going to be three that, that deal with um, slave issues under Reconstruction, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, and we call those the slavery amendments. So there's the 13th that got rid of slavery, 14th that says, hey, everyone, including slaves, has to be treated equally under the law. And finally, the 15th Amendment that says that you cannot deny anyone the right to vote on account of their race, their color, the fact that they used to previously be a slave, we call that servitude, um, that you cannot deny a person's right to vote. Now, the 15th Amendment, again, these are slavery amendments that came after the Civil War, is still really important today because we see, um, you're going to see this a lot coming up in the next election because people are concerned with the coronavirus, how we should be able to vote. And um, you're going to probably see people say, hey, you can't deny anyone their right to vote because they are quarantined at home or they're sheltering in place, in place at home. And so therefore, we need to do mail-in ballots. Um, pay attention. You're probably going to hear that come up as a 15th Amendment issue. You hear it modernly also today when people are talking about, should you have to show your identification to be able to vote? You have to have an ID to drive a car. You have to have an ID to rent things. But you do not have to have an ID to necessarily vote because under the 15th Amendment, you're saying, well, that's not fair because not everybody has an identification or a driver's license or something like that. So again, these are amendments that came in Reconstruction to deal with the issue of slavery but they're still applied to issues today. It's still part of the Constitution, and so equal protection, the right to vote, are still things that we hear a lot about. So pay attention. I bet you guys will hear this one coming up in the next election because of the coronavirus. Um, so as we come into this Reconstruction, you, there's different people who have different plans. So Abraham Lincoln, he was assassinated. He was killed 10 days after the Civil War ended. So he didn't get to use his plan, even though he had come up with something. The president who took over for Abraham Lincoln was Andrew Johnson, and he had his own reconstruction plan. And his was pretty simple. He says, you know, these former states, they just need to write a new constitution. They need to say, hey, we're sorry we left. We're going to repeal that act of secession. We're going to get rid of some debts. We're going to agree to the 13th Amendment where um, we're not going to allow slavery anymore. And we're going to elect our new government. And then Johnson says, dun, dun, done. That's all you need to do. Well, these are deeply embedded ideas in people, and so it's going to be much more difficult than just saying write a constitution, get a government, 
um, get rid of um, your act of secession and agree to the 13th Amendment. You're going to have to, you know, do the 14th Amendment, you're going to have to do the 15th Amendment, and it's going to be deeper than that. So what happens is because Johnson's um, reconstruction plan is not in depth enough, the South starts passing these things called black codes. So they create their own governments and they say, we're going to pass laws that will control the former slaves. Um, we're not going to let blacks vote. Well, that's going to be a problem. That's why you're going to need that 13th, 14th, 15th amendment um, because the black codes uh, started being enacted. And then this is a terrible thing the South does. They come up with this idea where they pass a law and they say, okay, if you're a former slave and you're, and you don't have a job, then, um, we have the right to arrest you because you're not employed and we can hire you out again. And so basically they're making them slaves again trying to do it within this, we don't allow slavery, but we have a law that says if you're not worked, if you're if you're not employed, if you don't work, then we can arrest you and then hire you out to someone um, so that you have a job, but yet you didn't choose that job. And so it's a, it's a big hot mess, this whole idea of black codes. Black codes also created segregation where um, blacks would have to be in one area, whites would be in another. They weren't treated equally. And so even though the Civil War was over, this stain of slavery continued under these black codes. Um, so Congress, trying to um, help former enslaved people, trying to assist them, comes up with this department within the federal government called the Freedmen's Bureau. And the purpose of this would be to bargain for um, working connect conditions, to give former slaves land, to give, as my son said, you get a mule out of the deal, you get a donkey, um, to provide uh, food, to give education to former enslaved people. And so the federal government's trying to counteract what's going on with the South by helping uh, former slaves. Because former slaves were not being treated equally, the federal government passed this Civil Rights Act of 1866. And this, this was, again, um, trying to provide that equal protection that we're going to see in the 14th Amendment. And this declares that all freedmen, all former enslaved people, to be full citizens and have the same right as white, same rights as white. Say that five times fast, that's pretty hard. Um, and again, this Civil Rights Act is in, ultimately ingrained into the Constitution through that amendment that creates what we talked about a minute ago, the equal protection. So when the presidential plan of reconstruction wasn't quite enough, Along came a second plan of reconstruction. It's like they keep coming up with ideas, trying to um, integrate the South and to ensure that enslaved people are treated equally. And you're, remember, we have the North and South and we have very different um, attitudes towards government, attitudes towards the way their economy runs, attitudes towards everything, right? And so the North being, the prevailers or the winners, the union wins the Civil War, um, they're going to say, okay, well, we'll come up with this military reconstruction um, and we're going to come and we're going to give more rules to the South. So yeah, you had to create new governments under Johnson's presidential reconstruction, but those governments have to be people that are loyal to the U.S. You can't have um, people who still want secession running the South. Um, if you had been a Southerner who had supported the Confederacy under military reconstruction, you don't have the right, right to vote. Well, then that comes up with all more problems of equal protection and the civil rights and who can vote and who can't. And they're trying to fix this, but I'm telling you, reconstruction was a hot mess. It created all kinds of problems, but I don't know that there's a better way to deal with it because it was just a messy time in American history. So out of this, trying to integrate the freed enslaved people, 
into society became this, this problem developed called sharecropping. And what sharecropping was is that if you were a freedman, a freedman is someone who was a former slave. So they could go to the plantation owners because remember plantations are these great vast area of land that um, need to be worked by the labor of others. Now, all of a sudden, they've lost their slaves, so there are no others to work their land. So the former slaves would rent parts of these plantations from the former slave owners, and in exchange for having that land, they would have to give up half of their crops to the land owner. And the idea was um, they thought, okay, this will help us gain independence, this will help us be free, but instead it basically just kept former enslaved people, the blacks, in this lifetime of poverty. So it didn't help blacks, it hurt them, and it helped the plantation owners because now they're having their land worked, they're having labor to work on their land, and they're getting a um, rent from that. But the people who are doing all the work, the former slaves, are still living in poverty. And they're technically free, but they're not free because they're having to work this land so that they can survive. And yet all of the, the benefits of their labor are going back to the landowner. So again, big old mess in sharecropping um, just didn't help Blacks the way that it it sounds like it might have. So Johnson, he's he's president. He's the first president to, he's the one who had that, that simple plan that said, do this, this, and this, and now I'm going to wash my hands of it. Um, and he is technically impeached. Impeached means that he is charged with a high crime or um, misdemeanor. And impeachment, we talked about this already a lot in U.S. history, particularly with my a uh, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade class. It's a constitutional way of removing a president from office if the president has committed a high crime or misdemeanor. Um, Johnson is accused of um, bringing the office of president into contempt, ridicule, and disgrace because he's opposing Congress and there's this, this fight between them. He is not actually removed from office. He's just impeached, which is kind of like being charged. Then you have to have a trial and it takes both um, houses to remove someone and Johnson is not removed, but he is impeached. He is the first of three of our presidents that are impeached. Bill Clinton is impeached as well. He is not removed. And Donald Trump um, just this last year was impeached, but yet not removed. So at one time it was very, very rare. Now we're up to three times in the history of our country. Once, just this last year that we talked about in class as well. Um, enforcement acts, those are laws passed to combat terrorism and so on and so forth in this time period. Um, amnesty, amnesty uh, was provided to former Confederates so that they could vote again. Remember, we just said if you had supported the um, secession and supported the um, Confederacy that you could not vote. So then now they're allowed to vote, which is going to make it even worse for African Americans, for former slaves, because they can pass laws that will just hurt former enslaved people. Big old promise. Um, again, we keep seeing to have we keep seeing compromises come up where we're trying where the government is trying to move forward, but we've talked over and over that it's difficult to compromise on moral issues. And so, um, the next president Hayes comes along and he says Southern states will have the right to control their own affairs, but if they control their own affairs and they're doing things that are morally wrong to blacks to former slaves they're not that's not going to be okay and we'll see things that happen like that where we have segregation we have grim jim crow we have this which is called a poll tax and so we saw the constitutional amendment that says former slaves have the right to to vote that your right to vote should not be infringed upon based on race religion any of that but yet 
the South decides to create a tax saying that if you want to come vote, you have to pay money. And on its face, that seems kind of fair. Whoever, whoever can pay can vote. And it costs money to run elections. Elections are expensive. It does cost a lot of money. And so it kind of seems sort of logical that those people that are voting should pay for the cost of running the election. Um, governments don't run themselves for free. It does cost money. So it seems like, okay, well, maybe a tax seems reasonable. Um, but the problem is, is that then the someone who's poor can't participate in the system. And that's not the purpose of democracy. That's not the whole purpose of our system. And so because of these poll taxes, voting became something that only rich white people could afford and that um, most blacks couldn't afford it. And so you're freezing out blacks from participating in the election. And we've already amended the constitution so that blacks could um, vote. But now that Southerners who supported slavery and the Confederacy are making laws, they're passing laws like this that are more of a hot mess again. So poll taxes are not uh, a good thing. They also pass laws requiring blacks to, or anyone, anyone, everyone had to pay the poll tax. So it seemed like it wasn't against blacks, but it really was. Everyone has to pass a literacy test to be able to vote, which again, on its face seems kind of reasonable. You should be able to read and understand what issues you're voting on before you vote. All of that seems reasonable. The problem is, is that um, the poor and, my, and mostly blacks couldn't read. So now they can't vote. So they can't pay a tax. They can't read. You're basically a freezing out African Americans out of the system and ultimately people who are um, who are poor and don't aren't as literate not able to read and write things like that uh, so what else happened so the South also creates a whole bunch of things called Jim Crow laws and these are laws that separate which is what's the word segregation means to separate, that separates blacks and whites after the Civil War. And laws, Jim Crow laws would be things that went all the way up until the 60s in the civil rights um, period that Martin Luther King fought against. Things that would say, you can have a separate school for whites and a separate school for blacks. You can have a separate drinking fountain for whites and a separate drinking fountain for blacks. You could have whites sit on one part of a bus and blacks sit on another part of a bus. And this was a laws that were designed to separate people instead of bringing people together. So Jim Crow laws were, again, another horrible thing. Literacy tests, Jim Crow laws, not good, poll taxes, all designed to treat people differently. But we read the Constitution and it says, hold it, we've amended it to say we're providing equal protection. We're amending it to provide um, voting rights to everyone. How can we have these laws? Well, that's a really good question. They seem unconstitutional. So there's a very famous Supreme Court case um, that basically said, hold it, these are unconstitutional. You're not treating people equally. The 14th Amendment says equal protection. We have to protect all citizens and and treat them equally. It doesn't matter if you're um, a man or a woman, if you're white or black, if you're Jewish or Christian, we have to have equal protection. So they go to the Supreme Court and they say, these are not okay. Well, this is terrible. This happened in 1896, the case Plessy versus Ferguson, the Supreme Court says, you know what, as long as they are separate but equal, it's fine. They have to be roughly equal. They don't have to be the same thing as long as they're, as long as they're roughly equal. And so that's like horrible. That's saying you can have one bathroom for whites and one bathroom for blacks as long as you have a bathroom for each they're roughly equal. You have a toilet, so that's equal. Well, what was happening is one would be clean and nice and convenient. The other one would be super far away and dirty and unmaintained and a mess. So Plessy versus Ferguson is what we call bad law. It's kind of like the um, Dred Scott case, bad law. Fortunately, 
I'll give a spoiler alert. There's another case that comes along. It's um, uh, the Board of uh, Brown versus Board of Education had to think what the case was. And Brown versus Board of Education said, you can't be equal if you're separate. That's ridiculous. You can't have one school for blacks and one school for whites and assume that they're equal. You have different teachers, you have different environments, you have different problems, or you have different you know, um, delivery of information. So Brown versus Board of Education actually overturns this case. That means they find that that case is, is bad. And so this doesn't have to be followed. But this is in the reconstruction period where racism and segregation and all of those things were still being allowed in the South. Okay, let's see where we are here. Um, Civil rights, it's its a term that we usually talk about for the first time real heavily under Reconstruction, and it's the idea that the rights that are guaranteed in the Constitution apply to everyone. And so that's what Martin Luther King Jr. was fighting for, was civil rights. It was, hey, all Americans, all citizens have these equal rights, and they apply to everyone, and you can't make laws that make people treated, that you can't make laws that treat people differently because then you're violating equal protection under the 14th Amendment and they, if you're treating people differently, they're not guaranteed their civil rights. And those civil rights include, you know, all kinds of things, the freedom of speech. If you, if you limit speech to a certain group of people, um, for example, if you were to tell students like you guys that you don't have a right to speak, you could say, well, that's violating my civil rights because you're treating students differently than you're treating other people. And so, so this idea, we see it a lot in the, when we talk the civil rights movement, not treating blacks equally because that's what's coming out of the civil war. You can talk about that, um, with someone with a disability? Are they not being treated equally because they don't have access to something because there is no wheelchair ramp? Um, those de denying them civil rights because they don't have the ability to get into a courthouse or something like that. A uh, couple of other terms that come out of this reconstruction period, scalawags being one of them, those were white Southerners who supported the federal government after the Civil War. So you're like, you scalawag, it sounds like a derogatory term. The Southerners would um, call people within the South who were supporting the Union uh, scalawags. Carpetbaggers is another term that I have next on the list. Um, those are Northerners who, after the Civil War, came into the South to start businesses, to gain political power, particularly initially before um, supporters of the Confederacy were forgiven under amnesty, and that this was considered like a derogatory term. If you move to an area to try and make some money, start a business, things like that, I'm not sure it should be such a such a negative thing. I, I hear it still today in America all the time, negative terms. If, if a um, person moves into an area and starts a business and they're not from that area, they're a carpetbagger, they're coming in, they're taking advantage of people. Maybe they are, maybe they're not. You, you hear it in pol pol politics. If a politician moves from one district to another, maybe to run for an office, they're called carpetbaggers. So that's a term I want you to be familiar with. If you were in a traditional history class, if you were one of my students in my old um, school that I worked at, we'd have a test at the end of the unit and you'd have to know what kind of all these terms were and what they meant. Um, another thing that happened in Reconstruction was the rise of a group called the Ku Klux Klan. And what that was was a um, secret society. They wore masks over their heads. You've perhaps seen it, the white pointed hood. And the whole purpose of the Ku Klux Klan was to drive African Americans out of political life, um, out of business, out of areas. They were sometimes used violence, oftentimes used um, threats and scare tactics throwing things through windows, burning things, um, 
stuff like that. This organization continued to be pretty prevalent in the South up through the 60s, Martin Luther King period. There are those that would argue that it still exists today, people that are obviously racist and opposed to um, African Americans, but it's not if it if it is in existence, it's not open and and overt. It would be illegal. It would be a hate group. It would be this type of activity would not be allowed. But that's not to say that there aren't people that are still evil and bad, because throughout the world we always have evil and bad people throughout time. But something that this was something that was really prevalent in Reconstruction up through um, the 60s. Again, those that there are those that would argue it still exists, but it's not something you see on the street corners like you would have in this time period of history. Um, we talked about this that a freedman is a former slave, and that's the end. Can you tell this was a exam review that I did for another class? It says study, study, study. You don't have to study, study, study because you don't have a test. But I do hope that you did fill this out if you are um, not coming to class on Thursday. If you are coming to class on Thursday, I will look forward to seeing you then. I uh, stop screen share. There it is. I'll look forward to seeing you on Thursday for our Zoom. And then we will have one more class where we'll talk about economic changes in our next class. So I hope everyone's doing well, and I look forward to seeing you then. Until then, take care, you guys. I'll see you guys all later. Bye.